So welcome to this uh, seminar, which is hosted by, uh, please come in. You see a monster? This is, um, this is part of Northwest series on uh, data science and mathematical biology, which is uh, jointly organized by University of Manchester and John, Liverpool John Moose University and University of Liverpool. Um, today, we are delighted to welcome Fayaz Minhas from Warwick. Uh, Fayaz is a computer scientist, a degree in computer science from Islamabad, Pakistan, and then a PhD from Colorado State University in bioinformatics. This is where he was a Fulbright scholar, I believe. Uh, Fayaz is a, an associate professor in Warwick in computer science at the moment, and he is affiliated with Tissue Analytics Center and also Computational Pathology Consortium Pathway. Um, Fayaz has a, a machine learn, learning focused research. He's quite, uh, quite a broad remit from biomedical informatics to digital pathology and Biomedical and data science. Um, so um, he tells me at lunch because he has a story to tell about machine learning and pathology. Uh, I needed to him to tell us that story. So uh, we are going to monitor from the audience on Zoom. Uh, we'll monitor the chat. If there's any question, please leave it in the chat. If there's urgent, I will interrupt us. Is that okay with you? Yes. And otherwise, we'll discuss them at the end of the talk. Okay, over to you, Pass. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for being here and on, online and uh, it's a pleasure to be in Manchester. Uh, I was trying to think of a good way of starting the talk, couldn't come up with anything. So I started Googling what is University of Manchester really good about and it appears that uh, there are many different things. One of them being that you guys uh, actually had uh, Robert Ford as a professor here in the course of so physics and physics. And one of the quotes uh, that he said about physics is all science is either physics or stamp collecting. So with respect, I would like to disagree with that because biology now is becoming more than stamp collecting. We're not classifying things into well, we are, but we are doing more than that. And pathologists also classify things into groups and then try to identify patterns uh, that lead to discovery of new disease. So however, how is that transformation taking place? That would be the focus of this talk. As uh, Madhasar said, I have a bit of an uh, identity crisis uh, in terms of across different fields. I apply machine learning essentially to different problems in biology and medicine. So before I move on to the pathology or the computational pathology part of it, I just like to give an introduction. I'm actually looking for collaborators. So this is my pitch for her. So some of the work that I did is actually on protein-protein interactions. Uh, essentially what that means is that if you have two proteins, uh, Let's say you've got a protein sequence and it generates a three-dimensional structure, right? You can see that. And let's say you've got two of them. Sorry, let's go back. Uh, I hope people online can see it as well. Let's say you've got these two different proteins now. Now you've heard of uh, AlphaFold, right? What AlphaFold does is that it's a machine learning or a AI model that takes in a sequence of a protein, an unfolded structure, and then, then uh, tries to determine what the structure of the folded protein looks like. What I uh, did as part of my PhD and some I'm uh, still doing it is try to predict if you've got two proteins, how do these two fit together, kind of like Lego blocks. So because they have complementary surfaces and different things, they should we should be able to predict given the structure or the sequence of the two proteins, how these two things fit together. So that's what's on the screen as well. What you see on the left hand side is a protein called chemodulin. All of us have it and the chicken also has it. All, almost all uh, animals have it, and it's pretty conserved across all of the all of the uh, animal kingdom uh, as well as plants. It's a really important protein in terms of regulating protein function uh, of uh, other proteins as well. And what I did is build a machine learning method that predicts that if one of the proteins is chemodulin, what other proteins bind to it, and where do those proteins bind? So if you are a biologist trying to work on chemodulin, please talk to me. The other thing is we use a uh, machine learning method, not only for chemodulin, but for all uh, for a couple of other proteins as well, where we try to make it more generic, like we have these two different proteins and then try to predict how these two bind together. And we use that to discover some novel interactions between cotton and cotton leaf curl virus. This was pre-COVID time. So we didn't have these big viruses then. So the 
virus that I worked with was between cotton and cotton leaf cell virus. And we found these different proteins, uh, which are shown over here, the areas that you see colored are the areas of those proteins that actually uh, interact between the two proteins. So we developed a machine learning method called PairFrat that does this. Uh, some of the references are below in a font that you cannot see probably, but yeah, I hope that's okay. Uh, so that's some of the work that I do. So if you're uh, interested in protein interactions, we can have a chat. I uh, also did some work on protein function annotation. Uh, so one of the things that we worked uh, toward was developing a predictor of uh, whether a protein like this one can act as an anti-CRISPR protein. So CRISPR is a gene editing technology. It allows you to edit uh, live DNA, but it doesn't come up come with an off switch. That means once you insert it into a cell, it can continue editing and that leads to problems. We want it to edit that part of the DNA where we want it to cut, right? But it, if it's uh, left in there, it would continue on cutting and that would lead to what are called off-target effects. One way of doing getting rid of that is something like this. If you, this is an example from nuclear physics, completely nothing to do with it, uh, with uh, biology. But what we essentially want is a is an emergency break, so that if we insert that rod into into the into the cell, it just stops the action of CRISPR at that time. Those proteins are called anti CRISPR proteins, and we wanted to discover together with uh, Jennifer Dubna over there in the corner, uh, how can we find using machine learning, how can we find proteins that can inhibit the action of CRISPR. So we developed a machine learning <coughs> method, much like the one that I already talked about, uh, sim similar to pair thread, but except that this is predicting whether a single protein can act as, a, as an inhibitor to the CRISPR system. So we give the real test of any machine learning method is not like what accuracy does it give on the training set, but whether it works in practice. So we found that out of the top five hits that we did, one of them was a really good protein that if you introduce that protein into a cell in which CRISPR is going on, it completely shuts it off. And it's a very small protein as well. So we gave up, gave up paper that says machine learning predicts new anti-CRISPR protein because this is the first time we discovered ice. Anyway, so that's uh, some of the work uh, that I've done. Recently, I've been, been interested in doing the exact same thing for pages. Uh, that is predicting the action of proteins within pages for antibiotic anti discovery. So we made a model. So if anyone's working in pages, please, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, what we did is we can predict whether well, this protein can act as a depolymerase. And what that means is, can it... So if you think of a bacteria, especially these, uh, the ones that are resistant to antibiotics, they come in a sort of an armor plating, which is made of sugars. And we want proteins that can dig into the, the armor and reach the core of the bacteria and then blow it up, hopefully, uh, mm -hmm. saving the person. Um, so that's the idea. So if we have some known in examples of, anti of, of such proteins, can we find other ones? So we call this one Depo-Renker. So if you're working on anything similar or anyone online, uh, just shoot me an email. I'm looking for collaborators in this domain as well. So this is uh, where I would make the switch from this is the only part of uh, the talk that is not computational pathology, because most of the work that I do now, uh, it's been three years since I became part of the Tissue Image Analytics Center. Why am I holding this? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and also PathLake, which stands for Pathology Image uh, Data Lake for Knowledge and Education, for Analytics, Knowledge and uh, Education. So we are funded by, the, by Innovate UK on our goal is to develop uh, essentially a, a big data set of pathology images with good annotations. And also to use this to train these methods to do automatic diagnosis leading to all of those good things that are mentioned on the bulk work, right? We want to do education training. We want to do better scale data management. AI algorithm development is key. Commercialization of those algorithms and then having an impact into the clinical and pharmaceutical applications. So essentially our vision is reinventing pathology with AI. And I'll talk about why we need that. So, by the way, if there are any questions, just uh, raise your hand or, or we can do it at the end. Plus it would know um, how these are not exactly what Yeah, either way is fine with me. So uh, what is actually computational pathology? Uh, and how many people actually know what computational pathology is? I just want to get an idea of, uh, okay, that's a good number. I've, I've given talks where there are a few people. So for others, uh, 
essentially what we want to do is pathology is making sense of disease. Why is a certain disease happening the way it is happening? And computational pathology is essentially using computers to understand disease. So that's the definition of computational pathology. What we want to do is to make use of these images, which are taken from patients. We'll call them both slide images, and I'll show you one in just a sec. Uh, we also can integrate other types of omics data, for example, genomics or transcriptomics data. And then we want to use AI or machine learning. I'll be using the two terms interchangeably uh, to make sense of why is a certain disease behaving a certain way. Can we make an algorithm that looks at an image the kind of one on the left, and then try to predict whether this was taken from a normal person or a person suffering from cancer. So that's the definition, this is my definition uh, of computational pathology. We want to use AI to help understand the cause, nature, origin, and patterns of disease for clinical pharmacological decision-making. Earlier, I just wrote clinical decision-making, but actually, a, a lot of drug companies are interested in whether their drug is having an effect or not. So that's where the pharmacological part comes in. So that's what we do as part of the Tissue Image Analytics Center at Warwick and at Pathic as well. Any questions? Just to get an idea of where actually we work in terms of the scale, uh, is there a question? I'm just going to take the mic and Okay. Okay. Uh, I hope this is much better. I'll try to talk a little bit louder, but that would be not so nice for people in the room. But <laughs> I'll, I'll try to strike a balance here. So, in terms of where do we actually stand uh, uh, in the scale, on the omics scale? So, we can do genomics, of course. So, that's the study of DNA. We can do transcriptomics, uh, the study of RNA. We can also analyze epigenomic data, that is uh, anything that is not gen genomics or functions in conjunction with genomics. We can also analyze proteins of, for cellular function. We can do cell level imaging, right? So if you think of a person, uh, this may be over here, I want to put a, the picture of the prime minister, but I didn't know which one to put in. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they have a, they have, they're composed of different systems and those systems are composed of organs, which are composed of tissues and tissues are composed of cells. And those cells are uh, expressed into proteins and those proteins are, uh, the expression of those proteins is dictated by a number of other factors, genomics and transcriptomics, that's where it comes from. So that's the overall scale of what we, what we do. We can image, we get an image, we must have had at least one x-ray in life, right? So we can do radiomics, take pictures of systems or organs, and then we can also take parts of the tissue out to do cellular or tissue level imaging. That's what I call by histology or histological imaging. This is typically done at uh, submicron resolution. That means a pixel in this image is going to be around 0.25 roughly microns per pixel. So 0.25 microns of something in real is gonna make up a single pixel in, the, in, in this image. So that's the scale that we are talking about. Histopathology has been there for a long, long while. Uh, and the longer something has been there, the more difficult it is to replace it because it works. So this is uh, someone develops or is, is suspected to have cancer. Uh, we can take a sample of uh, that person's tumor and then we can make a slide out of it, which is then viewed under a microscope by a pathologist, which then, with, and, and they generate a report that mentions what type of cancer they have, if they have it, and uh, other information as well. So this has been a conventional workflow of this pathology for quite a while. This, uh, a major advance in this uh, came when we replaced the microscope with a digital microscope or a slide scanner. So having a slide, once we prepared a slide, uh, and that involves a number of steps, uh, we take the sample, we put certain types of dyes on it, and then instead of viewing it under a microscope, we give it to a slide scanner, and we get these high resolution images. The image that you see, that is around 100,000 pixels by 140,000 pixels, so it's really big, much bigger than iPhone images, so yeah. But uh, it, it is at an, uh, at an image resolution of 0.25 microns per pixel. So you can essentially zoom in and look at different details. I have one image that I'd like to show you in just a minute, uh, a histology image. Pathologists look at this image now, and there have been a number of equivalent studies that uh, 
uh, that, that show that if you do it this way, it's roughly the same equivalent as looking at it to a microscope. So there isn't any loss of quality in diagnosis. Uh, so it, it allows for flexible working, and this is called digital pathology, by the way. So rather than conventional pathology, now you have digitized it. And in the UK, there are a number of labs that are now undergoing digitization. One of the big, bigger parts uh, of the project, of the Pathlake project, was actually digitization of a number of laboratories. Now we have Pathlake Plus, and that involves digitization of about 25 different laboratories across the country. So the goal there is to make it easy, first of all, for pathologists, they can be sitting at their home and look at these pathology images, thus accelerating the, the overall workflow. And it shows good concordance, but I'll, for the reasons that I'm going to come to in just a sec, this is not enough. We need to help pathologists save more time so that they're more efficient at their job by using AI. And if you do that, that is what is called computational pathology. So you take a look at these images and then you have AI assisted diagnosis uh, in which the AI looks at the image and then sees how many cells there are and so on, what type of different cells there are, what are the patterns and and, and, uh, and uh, then it can generate or help the pathologist generate the report. So that's the major change in the, in the workflow itself. So why is it a good idea? Before actually looking at this image, let me show you a, a real image in which we can zoom as well. So uh, can you, use, yeah, good. This is uh, what a pathologist typically sees, yes. Would this also, uh, this computational pathology risk be used in NHS as well? Is it an NHS? That's the goal. That that's where we want to get to. Yes. Uh, one of the one of the exemplar projects under Pathlake is actually developing a a screening algorithm for colorectal cancer. I'll be talking about that, and and hopefully one day we'll be able to use it in the in the labs. Thank you. Uh, so this is what an image looks like. You can zoom in. Too fast. So it's kind of like Google Earth's size image. Let me get rid of the overlay for now. This is someone's, uh, this is a sample of someone's tissue taken from their gut and then laid on a microscope and scanned after addition of certain dyes. So you can look at these beautiful glands that aid in digestion and uh, nutrient absorption, but you can also take a look at different type of cells. So these flowery bits, at least, I'm sorry, I think I missed it or something. I hope it moves again, but you get the idea, right? So we can zoom in to form the whole tissue up to submicron level resolution. So that's the good thing about this. And we'll come back to this uh, towards the end of the end of the talk anyways. And in the, in the meanwhile, I hope it loads. Now, let's say if, if you have an image like this and you ask a pathologist how many fat cells there are, here's what I've been for pathologists do. They would pick a certain region and then they would. Yeah, 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 yeah I know, I know. <laughs> so, so they pick a certain region and then use that to sample how many cells they see or what the expected percentage of cells is there for fat cells. Those are the whitey bits that we don't see very well here. But using an AI algorithm can give you a very crisp answer that it thinks that 45.9% of the overall tissue is composed of fat. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that we can, can do with computational pathology. How do these methods actually work? Uh, so this is a tutorial that we ran for high school students, actually not even high school, grade school students. Uh, in which we trained them to detect cancer cells within pathology images. No child labor was involved. Okay. Uh, so we stained, uh, we got some tissue uh, in which we had stained some of the cells and some of those tumor cells were large and they would appear as brown. So we told the, the school students that anything that you see large like this one in the image and it's brown, then that is a positive tumor cell, which is shown as red dots in this. Uh, in this figure over here. Similarly, there can be smaller cells that can be brown, but those are non-tumor cells because they are not large. Similarly, there can be other types of positive non-tumor cells and negative non-tumor cells in there. So we, this is the problem we, we gave them. So we had kids, showed them these images, trained them, 
and then ask them by showing a new image, how can you spot all the, all the red bits? And we took, gave them some guesses that it's the size of the cell and the brownness of the cell that you can use to infer whether a cell is a positive tumor cell or not. Probably there would be other features that pathologists use, but those kids were really sharp and they actually did quite well uh, in comparison to a panel of pathologists for this particular task. But if you think of it in terms of machines, so we call it beat the pathologists. Well, I don't know whether the goal was to beat or to beat, I don't know, but, but they did a good job there. Okay, so uh, here's the machine learning view of it. What we essentially do is extract features from each of the cell. So take, think of one single cell that we saw earlier, and it has a brownness in it, and it has a size, right? If we lay it on this two-dimensional axis, what we see is that we can probably make a line uh, to separate all the red dots, which are positive tumor cells, from anything that is not red dot, right? We can move this line and try to improve our predictor. So if this is a line, we know that this is not a good line because it shows that one of the cells is above the line, while other tumor cells, these red dots, are below the line. We want the line to be placed such that all of the red dots are either above the line or all of the red dots are below the line and have, have everything else is on the opposite side of the line. Then. So out of these two lines, uh, the darker line that you see is the pattern. This is essentially at a very low level. This is what AI would be doing. We would extract some features and then try to infer a predictor, which can be a line in which case we call it a linear predictor, or you can have non-linear ones as well. So this is again at a very high level what these AI models would, would do. Once you have some training data, you can use it to find where the line would occur. But that's very restrictive if you think about it, because we would only be able to separate data that are linearly separable. What about data that is not linearly separable, right? So what if we have data that looks like something like this, right? Well, in these case, cases, you can use nonlinear methods, which essentially do the following. Just like this one, if, if, if I come back to the problem where we have these linearly separable cases, you can make a separate, you can make a single cut like this, and this is the classifier, right? You have separated the two things very neatly, right? What if you have a case like this? What do you do then? Well, one trick that you can do is to fold the piece of paper, right, like this, and then make a single straight cut. And once I make that cut over here, right, it would be able to separate all the red dots from the blue ones. You can try this exercise, it's extremely simple, right? So this is what nonlinear methods do. And essentially, this is what deep neural networks do as well. Like once we have stacks of layers, each layer that we have takes your original data points or the feature space into a different feature space. And there you can draw a line and then it will be separable. The good thing about deep learning is that if you have sufficient amounts of data, you don't even need to define what features to pick up. Those features are also going to be learned from the data itself. So you don't need to define what brownness is. It should automatically be able to pick up our feature, which may not be the feature you are interested in, but it would allow separability of your data set. And that's how these machine learning methods work. If anyone is interested, they can try to separate or the same frame uh, on, on this data set, which is actually easy. Like you can just hold it like once, twice, and I think that would do it. And just cut it. And then you get a hole in the middle, right? So those are what deep learning methods do. This is left for exercise for everyone. In the <laughs> Doesn't matter. Let's move on. So I hope we now have an introduction of how these methods actually work. So the goal is to collect some data for annotations and then use that to train these machine learning methods, which essentially make a cut in some feature space. All machine learning methods can be viewed as a partitioning of any feature space. So that's a good way of thinking about it, right? But we want a cut that works for the training data that we have, where we know what the labels are, but also for test data for which we do not know labels. And that is the real goal. We want to predict cancer for patients that have not yet been diagnosed. Okay, so that's the goal there. Why is this a good idea? Why, is, why do we want to apply machine learning to 
uh, pathology because we can and because there is a very good business case for it. On the right hand side, in very little font or very small font, you can see something that says stopping prices in 19 uh, in pathology and was published in the BMJ in 1981. And that crisis hasn't gone away. It's actually still there. And now we also have an aging workforce. So we've got fewer pathologists. We have these screening programs running across the country for cancer. And that means people like pathologists are, are really in, in high demand. And if we can help save their time, that is going to be useful. The plot that you see in the middle shows you that we haven't, as a nation, haven't met the goal of diagnosis diagnosing people's cancer within 62 days for the past seven years. And that's really tra traumatic for someone who doesn't know or knows who has been sampled for cancer, but doesn't have a response yet. Okay. Can we use compute and the large amounts of data to essentially make predictors that would help pathologists? And also we have this, uh, uh, a really sweet spot in history where we have all the compute available. We have a DGX A100. We have got two of those babies uh, in the DIA center, and those help us run all of the heavy computational uh, learning process. However, that's not enough in itself. We also have very good advances in algorithms, and that has resulted in a lot of libraries for deep learning. Uh, there is uh, PyTorch that I use, and then there's everything else. Okay, uh, those are also good as well. But but we are at that point in in in, in the scientific development process where we have all of these tools to be to be able to do all of uh, all of the fancy things we want. Okay, so the goal is essentially the following. I'm good on time. Uh, if you're given an image like this, can you predict? You by you mean think of yourself as an AI, right? Can you predict whether this person this image shows any forms of cancer in it or not. What if it does, what is the grade of that cancer? And that would, what is, that would be what is called a regression problem in computational pathology. Can you identify what regions are the tumor regions? Those are, in my humble guesses, areas that are dark and have larger cells and abnormal looking cells. Can we segment those cells? Can we check how many cells there are that are abnormal? Can we determine whether this person would be uh, uh, would be receptor positive or negative? And uh, doesn't really matter right now. But when a pathologist makes a decision or an oncologist makes a decision of what therapy to give, it's not just enough knowing that whether someone has cancer or not. It's what type of cancer, what types of drugs are they going to respond to? And we want to know all of that from the pathologist support, or in this case, an AI system. Can we predict from the image whether someone has a mutation in their XY, that pathway that can lead to cancer? Can we predict their survival? How long would they survive with this disease? Can we predict drug response? Can you help me retrieve other images that look similar, not in shape, but in diagnostic, uh, in some sort of diagnostic relevance? Can you predict those? Can we identify new biomarkers? So this is where the brother core story comes in. Can we find patterns that allow us to categorize, categorize these stamps into their proper category, but we were using image analysis, right? So that's what we want to do. There are two major flavors of computational pathology. If there are any questions, by the way, I'm, I'm probably not giving you enough time to think. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. There are two major flavors you can do computational pathology in. One of them is what is called the bottom-up approach, in which you have a, have a whole slide image, and your goal is to detect, segment, and classify all of the cells or other histopathologically important uh, structures. And those can be glands. So you can see in this image, let me zoom in if I can. If you look at this image, for example, this was a simple pink and purple image, and all the other colors that you see have been generated through AI. So your goal is to detect all the cells. So every dot, dark dot that you see is a nucleus of a cell that is colored differently. The boundary of the nucleus is colored differently. For example, this one over here is green, 
which indicates that these are probably epithelial cells. And then you can have other types of cells within the image. So you want to identify all of these cells, but you also want to detect other bigger structures. And in this case, this bigger structure over is what is called a gland. So you want to detect gland, do gland segmentation. So what you want to do is to build a profile of the tissue that you have selected out, the, out of the patient. Once you have that, you can start asking really interesting questions. What is, how is grade associated with the, what patterns determine grade? What patterns determine the response to a certain therapy? What patterns in this determine their response or, or, their, or, the, or a patient's survival? So this is what we call the bottom-up approach <laughs> where you have, you do all of these segmentation tasks and detection tasks, and then you will get is a very well characterized image of your whole slide. But these images are really big, as I said earlier. So you need very efficient and uh, robust methods that are that 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 can be used to do this sort of detection and segmentation. The other way to do is, well, before we do go there, actually, how would we train such a machine learning method? We would need to get training labels for each of the cell types that we want to detect. And that means asking a pathologist to come and sit, which never happens. <laughs> so, so we, because they're busy, right? Remember, that's the point of uh, us developing this. But for training the AI, we actually need to ask them to do all sorts of annotations so that we can train our method then. And then it does this to help them, right? So we are doing that to some extent, but it's a uh, it's difficult for multiple reasons. It's not just pathologists don't want to give their time or they're really busy. It's just that there are inherent limitations of the human visual system as well. They're not able to see all types of cells that may be picked up by an AI, for example. So how do we get around that? Yes. Are there any? I mean, this is like a, no, it would work for supervised cases. Are there any ways? Uh, you come across these structures which are so doesn't have a name on it. Right. You, that would be in something that's difficult to see, even it's not known already. Yeah. So the controls if an unsupervised version would be find those structures that could be part of Yeah. So what you're saying is essentially if we have, let's say, a label for the whole slide image, can we infer what structures are correlated with the occurrence or hopefully positive of, of that particular disease, right? That's exactly the other uh, way of doing it, where you have whole slide level image labels, and then your goal is to train machine learning methods on these whole slide image level labels to infer what in this image makes it a cancer image, or what in this image makes the patient respond to a certain treatment. So this is what we call the, the other way of course, I forgot whether this was, I think this was bottom up and that is top down, right? It doesn't really matter. There are two flavors of this, right? So there on the right hand side, we don't need annotations at the cell level, but now we need annotations at the case or the image level, right? And those are easier to come by. And once we have those, we can use these weekly supervised learning methods to, to infer these structures that what else we're talking about. Yes. Right. Uh, and the whole site images have quite uh, high resolution and yeah. it's also not easy to sort of capture always for all the cancers. Can this weak supervised approach be applied with meshing that are trained on some other images, like for example, to detect features from mountains or trees or, or bikes or something else? Yeah, so that is something called, you, you can use, when you train a method to detect, for example, an apple from an orange, right? It will be learning some features, hopefully, that are very specific to the problem, but it will also be learning some features that are more generic. What people typically do is they chop off the later layers in the, in the neural network and then use the, the other features, which are hopefully more generic in the process for transfer learning to do exactly that. So it can be done. Actually, some of these methods were trained in a on, on something completely different and then adapted for doing this. Yeah. Can these type models work together? You have sort of like, you know, you principally find the feature that feed into two models, you know, feed into each other to sort of like come to the ground. Yes. Okay. Last slide. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> 
Okay, so we've got these two different ways of doing this, right? Each one of them has their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of the left hand side is we would know exactly what's going on because we'll be picking up cell level features which we know have been annotated by expert pathologists. And if you're working with pathologists, they're never wrong. They may not agree with one another, but none of them is ever wrong. But the right hand side, on the other hand, is you're using it can pick up features that the pathologist may never pick up. And some of the times, if you, for example, pick all of the images of cancer patient from hospital A, and hospital A does its imaging a bit differently than hospital B, then instead of picking up the cancer, what you would be picking up is where did the image come from? So they can be problematic. So you need a large number of images to do a good job for the right-hand side approach. So the first thing that we want to do is to get annotations. So what we have done is uh, written for our pathologist friends a set of guidelines that they can use to uh, get these annotations. And we've made some tools, uh, annotation servers, that allow a pathologist to do annotations at the whole case level. That is multiple images in a single case at the slide level, at the region level, and at the cell level. So you can do all of these. Uh, but to get a number of a large number of annotations from pathologists for cell level annotations is very hard. So we have developed some AI tools in which the pathologist can just go in and do dot 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 on the cells, and then the AI draws the remaining boundaries just like the ones that you see. And then that makes it training data for us. So there's a method that we've developed called nucleic or nucleus click, right? So you just click on the nucleus and then it uh, tries to find the boundaries of the nuclei. You can also use AI to classify regions. Uh, so A through H over here are different types of tissue that you can see within a whole slide image. A is tumor epithelium, uh, B is stroma, which is a different tissue. I don't know much about it, to be honest. Uh, but there can be, you can at least make it out from the background, right? So that's, imagine if we can use an, an AI to train, give it a patch of the, from the big image, and then ask it, what type of patch is this? Is this a tumor or not? And then you get, we would get some estimates of where the tumor boundaries are. So you can do this sort of region classification to, to help uh, computational pathology uh, analyze images, right? Uh, we recently ran a challenge. It is called the Conic Challenge. It is currently the world's largest repository of annotated nuclei. So we asked our pathologist friends to annotate about half a million different cells. They were very, they were very kind. They were like dotting cells and drawing circles around them, or where the nuclear boundaries are. And then we ran a challenge. We gave this data set to the community and asked them to build machine learning methods so that a patch of the image goes in. And then their task, the task of the machine learning method is to predict what type of cell it is, where it is, and then draw a boundary on it. On it. And uh, uh, we're currently writing the, we've got some really great submissions. This challenge actually pushed the state of the art significantly. We'll be publishing it in, uh, we're currently writing it. But uh, hopefully, it will be online on bioarchive uh, soon. Okay. So, if you are working on cellular annotations, this may be an exercise you may be interested in. So, this is nuclear segmentation. We have made a method called HoverNet because it uses horizontal and vertical edges. So, that's where Hover comes in. And then you feed it in a patch, and then it's able to draw boundaries and segment different types of cells. So, this was our in house baseline for the conic challenge, which has been even improved by the improved further by the community. Now we want you to detect not only cells but other type of structures in the tissue as well. So we made a method called Cerberus, which does it all for us. We called the paper one model is all you need and didn't pay any regard to how cocky this sounds. <laughs> right? But it does the job, right? So you feed an image as input, it detects cells and it also identifies different type of uh, glands surface epithelium, and other type of structures that are important from a diagnostic perspective. So this does pretty detailed phenotyping of the tissue just from the, from the image itself. We can also detect mitosis from h and e images. So where is mitosis going on? It's really hard to spot 
there is one over here, and everywhere you see a white dot, we ask uh, a pathologist and use some other markers to identify where mitosis was going on, and then train a machine learning method that takes this image as input and then predicts where is mitosis going on. Now, this is a exercise that pathologists, especially breast pathologists, do whenever they want to create someone's cancer. So imagine a pathologist looking at this image and then trying to identify all of the mitosis in there. It's a hard task. So with, hopefully with this AI, they will be able to uh, do it faster. You can also use it for survival prediction. Uh, like you can extract features. So one very common feature that pathologists and uh, have identified is the co-occurrence of tumor cells and lymphocytes. So these are bodies, root cells fighting the cancer cells, which are bad. If they co-occur, the response to certain therapies is better, the survival is better. So what we did is, because we had profiling done on the whole tissue where we knew what type of cells occur where, based on this output, for example. So we identified, we calculated a score called, or a feature called the till abundance score. And we found that it is able to pro prognosticate different type of cancer patients. So that's all the bottom up part. But as I said, any questions on the bottom up? Where we start at the slide, detect cells, and then go for all the other tasks. Martin? Oh, I was actually going to ask a question, but since you've asked me, I'm just wondering, that's a very impressive Captain Maya in terms of separation. Can you tell us a bit more about what you were looking at? This one? Yeah. I mean, I would have thought people dream of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I, as I remember, this one is for head and neck cancer. And uh, the data came from a hospital in Pakistan where it's a major issue. It's actually one of the biggest cancers in Pakistan because of chewing tobacco. Mm -hmm. And there they were trying to predict, as I remember, disease specific survival of two different patients, patient groups. Uh, but I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what the control group was in this okay. case. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. But yeah, yeah. It's it, but it, that, that's the whole point that it gave us really good separation and we knew exactly what it was doing. That is yeah. predicting the co occurrence of tills. Yeah. The other way of doing it is the weekly supervised way because getting labels from pathologists for cells and region is hard. So why not just use whole slide image level labels? So that's the that's the other way. And this work, this sort of work has been going on in the in this area for quite a while now. And people have used it to predict things that they never thought could be predicted from whole slide images. For example, microsatellite instability is one of them. We've done some work on that. There's the pioneer group in that was led by Jacob Kather. Uh, there's also some work on predicting mutations. So you've got a whole slide image. And you have the gene sequencing data for the same patient. We can use the gene sequencing data to identify whether a person has a mutation or not. And then can we identify any different features or can we predict using the image whether the person would have a mutation or not, right? So that's the goal of these. You can also do it for gene expression profiling. Uh, there's also some work on detecting where did this cancer originate from. So you've got a whole slide image and a single label that we don't know what in the image caused it or is correlated with this particular label. That's how to do this. So this is the, so how do these methods work? How do these, so how do you give it this whole side image, which is really big. So you can't fit it into memory and, but want to make inference on this. Uh, so weak supervision works typically in the following way. What you do is you take an image, you chop it up into small patches of tiles, right? Like the one that you show with, uh, seen over here. And then, at a, as a very naive case, you give the same label as the host ID image level label to each of the patches. So the assumption is everything in the image or the small parts of the image is associated with its label. Now, of course, that's wrong because if there's tumor, there's only a small part of the image would contain a tumor and not the whole thing, right? But that's a surprisingly good proxy to begin with. And then what people did is made improvements on using different types of fancy machine learning methods to make it better. And uh, the field has come quite a long way to, to really improve prediction from both side images. I have an analog for this. Uh, so imagine you had an elephant 
take the one that you see over there. And all you could see was a small patch, right? Depending upon, and you were blindfolded by the way, so you didn't know if there was an elephant in front. So whatever you grab was the inference you made, right? So if someone had a spear in their hand, they would think it's a spear, not an elephant's tusk. And that's the problem when you look very locally. What we want is a way, because we can't fit the whole of the image, we want a way of doing it both at the local level and at the global level simultaneously. That is what is called the aggregation problem in computational pathology. That's my favorite problem, by the way, uh, in, in this area, the technical part at least. So how can we improve this? Uh, and one day when I was playing Risk, does anyone play Risk? It's a very good way of losing friends. <laughs> so I recommend it, right? It's a board game where you have a board laid out in front of you and your goal is of course uh, to conquer the world. You can place your armies in a certain part of the world and those armies can move into another part of the world based on the dice rule, right? You can think of this whole thing as a graph, which computer scientists absolutely love. So this can be represented in as a graph. And if you think about it, a certain region in this image would have your armies in it, and the neighboring area may have someone else's armies in, the, in it, and your goal is to take over their army, right? It's pretty much what goes on in cancer cells as well. If you think of a certain region <coughs> over here in this region, for example, this may be, for example, humerus region, and it may be surrounded by lymphocytes, and there may be a battle going on between the two. But because you're picking small patches, you may just pick a patch that is solely composed of a certain types of cells and not others. So a graph is a what I gave a very natural data structure to model these images. Uh, during the lunch break earlier, I was asked this question, why graphs? So this is the reason why graphs, because they provide you with context, okay? So you can represent a whole slide image as a graph, and now you have a featured representation for each part of the image, and you can count how many different types of cells there are, and how many cells are there in the neighboring, and what are the types of those cells, let's say, or any abstract feature representation. Yes. Because how do you define the nodes for the graph? That's a very good question. There are many different ways. What we do is chop it up, cluster, based on some feature representation and then interconnect. But so there, there are many patches, different ways. Patches of images that you then. Yeah, it's a patch of images. Yeah. Yes. Why did you do that rather than making it sound like that? We have, there's, there's another. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So think of it like this. We can use a, a base network that takes in a node of a graph and then generates uh, output by pooling all the decisions from all of the nodes in the graph. But we can do it at multiple layers, and I don't have the time to go into the details of this, but this is what it's called a graph neural network. Think of it like this. If I just make a graph, this is a cluster of people sitting over here. There's a cluster of people sitting over here. We can develop a feature representation for this table, and because this table is adjacent to this one, we connect them with a certain edge. When we are trying to make inference on what is it that makes this table cooler because it has a pathologist on it, <laughs> right? <laughs> then the other one, we might be able to infer it down the road, right? But now, because we have modeled it as a uh, as a graph, we can do it for the whole room, and we'll be able to fit it into memory as well. <laughs> so that's the that's the basic idea. There's a, so this is the talk that I gave, it's called post line Images R Graph, just on this topic. So if you are interested, it's available on YouTube as well. That's how I make money anyways. Uh, so you have these images and now we used a model them as graphs and then you can uh, do inference on them. So this can be done at the patch level, Martin, uh, but it can also be done at the cell level. So this is the work that we recently did for the previous one was for breast cancer, the separate status <laughs> using both side images as graphs. This is for mesothelioma here. The graphs were smaller, but the number of nodes was larger because we had cells as individual nodes. Yeah. And uh, when you're making the graph, is it possible to consider multi-modal information as well? So yeah. it's 
Okay. Yeah. The spatial trafficking. We have the image peak that lets you have the task trafficking from two yeah. and so you can have a node that can have a heterogeneous feature that is great. Yes. Yeah. So here again, the, the label was given to us at the at the core level, whether this is epithelial or sarcomatoid or biphasic. And we didn't know what structure or what type of cells actually gave rise to that particular label. So we used again the same idea, just applied in a different way. We use it for survival analysis as well, the exact same algorithm, just with a different thing at the end. Uh, and this is uh, our most recent work as part of Pathway. Uh, here, the goal was to predict whether someone has cancer or not. Uh, so when a person is screened, a sample of their gut is taken, and then a pathologist has to take a look at all of the images they, they get. Because of rising, the rise in cancer screening, the number of patients is much larger, the number of pathologists is much smaller. So if we can do rule out sort of thing, in which the AI says, this is, I'm pretty confident that this is normal. At a sensitivity of 99.5, the AI says that this image is normal, the pathologist doesn't need to take a look at it. That's the problem that we were tackling in this cancer screening. And we use the exact same algorithm, the graph-based method. Now the graph-based algorithm allows you to do the middle ground or the top down and the bottom up approach depending upon what features you use. In this case, what we use are features defined at each gland. And if one has one abnormal gland, they would have cancer. They may have cancer. And you were able to do pretty good uh, in terms of overall specificity. Uh, the paper is available online. We call it iguana. For what other reason? Uh, right. <laughs> but it, it's also explainable. It can tell you exactly what did the image, what did the method break up. Uh, all of these technologies that I've talked about are now av available as part of our TIA, Tissue Image Analytics Toolbox. If you want to use that, this is our uh, toolbox for free. So you can go ahead and, and use that. Uh, I think I'll just stop here in the interest of time. Uh, so just coming to the last slide, uh, this is where I think computational pathology is at right now. There's still a lot of work to be done on discovering new patterns so we can um, uh, add at least one more Nobel laureate to the five already existing pathologist Nobel laureates uh, using computational pathology. There's a lot of commercial work coming along over there, but there's still a lot of work to be done in this domain. So I hope you like to talk. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Any questions from the audience there? So quick one. Yeah, very quick one. So instead of that, uh, um, in terms of the digital pathology, is it always speaking images typically? No, or it can be any. It's so so both of the methods have been developed for HME because that's the most widely used in because it costs the least. But uh, there's a lot of work on IHC imaging as well. Um, there is one question in the chat, but it's quite it's quite a general one. It's about how to get involved in computational pathology if you're mm -hmm. someone in machine learning. Basically, really, really contact you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, definitely get in touch. But it's a, it's a very good area for machine learning scientists to get into. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of interesting problems here. And we need people to develop bespoke solutions for this area. So right now, what the field is doing, take a solution in from computer vision and then apply it. But we need to go more. Okay. One, 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 one quick comment. I think the last slide, when you combine these two approaches, does it save you from having lots of training data? Yes. It helps you. Yeah. And then it's explainable as well. So there, we have to go. Yeah. Uh, but next, we want another talk from you on genomics and electronics. I thought. There will be a couple of slides in there, but we don't have the time. Yeah. I apologize. Now we will thank again for us. Thank you very much.